everybody, and welcome back to Trek Yards. As always, I'm Captain Foley. Welcome. And today we have a special guest joining us. Who is it? Who do I see down there? <laughs> it's John Eves in Utah, hanging out cool. with you guys, spread across All, the globe. Always a fun time when we have John join us. He's amazing. So, And today is going to be one of those days where we talk about an unused design concept that John has created. And this one's pretty fantastic, I got to say. Samuel, what are we looking at today? I love the no bias going in straight at the start there. <laughs> <laughs> so... You gotta think back in the day, guys. A new series has been announced. It's it's called Enterprise, and it's a prequel. Uh, so we need a new Enterprise, a first Enterprise. And John was one of the people that was brought in to potentially design this new Enterprise that could have, should have, would have, maybe been the NX01. This is an NX01-ish something. John, hey there. Tell us a story of this pretty incredible concept for the first Enterprise prequel, Enterprise. All right. Well, there you go. Well, we can finish. <laughs> Uh, DS9 in uh, 99 and we kept thinking we were going to do another movie so we're all waiting 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 it doesn't come doesn't come and then Herman Zimmerman calls he goes I'm bringing the crew together but for another TV show mm. called Star Trek an untitled TV show there was no title <laughs> for it at the time so we brought uh, everyone together from DS9 except Doug Drexler who was on uh, some CG stuff over at Foundation Imaging um, he brought Louise Dorton, who was new. She was an art director. Um, she did stuff on Voyager, but it didn't work with us. So she became our, uh, our art director on the show. And our first assignment was work on the new Enterprise. NX it wasn't an NX-01 at the time. It was just the hero starship. And so we started drawing stuff along the lines of the original series. And we didn't know the time frame exactly and all that stuff yet. All that kind of came together as we were going. So uh, I started drawing uh, starships based on the original series with a little bit of mesh of the motion picture because that's mm -hmm. kind of what they mm -hmm. wanted to see. So it was like this mishmash of the two ideas. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. this went on for a very, very, very long time. And at the same time, we're getting script pages in. They were coming quite quickly. So we had all these new races coming, the Sulaban, and we had uh, the, the Helix ship. And we had all of this stuff compiling on top of, of this thing, and the ship was just not going where they wanted it to go. And so um, Herman goes, what do you say we try and get a hold of, of Doug and maybe he can moonlight and maybe do some of these 3D models that he's so good at right now? And so uh, we called him up, and um, and uh, so he, on the side he started doing these little 3D models, and they were all fantastic. And uh, he did like these bare metal versions and all this stuff, and it was still along the lines of the, the TOS at that time. And so um, Doug still had quite a bit of time where he had to spend on this foundation imaging thing, but he didn't have time to moonlight. And so uh, <laughs> I'm going to tell a bad story. You can cut it out if you want. But uh, what had happened, you know, he was an Oscar-winning makeup artist, award-winning makeup artist. And he needed a week off to work on this ship. So he went home Sunday night, came up with a plan, got his makeup kit out, and made himself up to look like he had the flu. He looked horrible. Black under his eyes, pale skin, all of this stuff. And he didn't just make a phone call. He went into foundation and goes, gee, guys, I really don't feel that good today. And they go, geez, go home. Get out of here. Let's take as much time as you want to recover. So he gets out of his car <laughs> and goes to work on the, the starships for uh, for a week. And um, his end came, so he got to come over on the show. But uh, with all the stuff going on, I had to transfer over to other stuff. And so I, I did these versions of the ship. Like I said, the particular drawing you have there was kind of the final idea I, I had drawn up. And Herman really liked it. Um, we didn't go too well with the production end, the producer end of, of things. They go, we want something different, but we don't know what we want yet. And so uh, I moved to Sulaban and all the other stuff, and, and Doug came on and did probably probably four months of NX designs. All of them were fantastic, fit right in. And um, Mr. Berman at that time had just gotten on the internet. Uh, Dave Rossi had shown him how to how all that worked, and um, they were they go well. Let's look at all the ships from Star Trek: First Contact. So all the models and all the new stuff that was coming out was on there, and the Akira Akira was there. And someone had brought in from licensing a model kit of it. He's looking at that, and he flips it over, and he goes, "Let's make this the NX-01." And so Doug ran with that. But both of us, for 
a good probably six months total together mm -hmm. did variations on this ship that just went nowhere but they were all based on the tos kind of idea and uh what you see here is probably the most one that looks the most like in our enterprise because the previous step we had long a cells we had long bodies all, all this different configuration so trying to work out these odd configurations that would be an enterprise but a pre-enterprise took a long mm -hmm. time it took a long time so I'd have to say I, a lot of the stuff Doug did, he lost. He had a big hard drive crash. Yeah. I think I have prints of a lot of the stuff, but some of his earlier stuff was was so perfect. You'd look and go, oh, like the some of the early, early Ryan Church enterprises that he did for the JJ movie were so remarkably mm -hmm. perfect. And uh, no, but so, that's that's where that went. So because we're Trek Yards, we're gonna look at this ship and these sketches and ask you questions about what we think things might be. One thing I gotta say right off the bat, the front view looks very much like the Ryan Church JJ Enterprise, uh, just with the, the way the struts are kind of angled. And the side view is very, very reminiscent of the Vengeance. Uh, just the secondary hull shape and the squat neck. Hmm. So I don't know if they use, I don't know if, Obviously, un, 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 uh, unplanned at that time. But, uh. <laughs> Maybe they use these as some kind of inspiration. Who knows? But, uh, yeah, it's an interesting-looking ship. Yeah, like the only thing that transferred from what I was doing to Doug is the uh, the notch in the front mm -hmm. of the saucer and that little divide for the bridge. That was like the only thing that kind of carried over and uh, that ran from there. And uh, as you see on the nacelles, on the inside of them, they have like a plating, like a little plate towards the back. Hmm. And that wanted to be an, uh, an architecture detail that we carried throughout the whole show when we did starships. And we hmm. thought that the nacelles were so volatile and dangerous at that time hmm. that you needed an extra shielding on the inside to kind of keep the uh, the two from crossing and causing an, an internal explosion. So that was basically a shielding scenario hmm. that we came up with. And uh, so it's very, very lightweight there. But uh, like when you get to the... Uh, the, uh, the the warp two ship and all that stuff is it's a little bit more pronounced, but um, that's where that kind of came from. But being with the Phoenix, you had the body in the middle, so you didn't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. So, so in, in the sort of timeline of, of this, obviously you designed the Phoenix first, um, so you already knew what the sort of first warp nacelle looked like. Is that very much your your own inspiration was yourself for these engines or? Because you sort of said you didn't know when it was put in time, but this was one of the latest iterations of that. When you yeah. designed this version, did you know it would be a prequel, the first Enterprise, or was it still? Yeah, we knew it was going to be somewhere between uh, the uh, the Zephyr Co Cochran uh, time era, first contact, and TOS. We knew it was going to be somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. So I get to lend the the Phoenix design to a lot of this stuff, and that's why you still you have the cleats on the front of the the Bassard collector and uh, the the tubular style and the little cutouts and stuff so we, we figured that by the time you get to the tos enterprise where you have the real smooth nacelle carriage all of this stuff will have funneled away and uh, mm -hmm. so we did like a, a kind of a, a medium between the phoenix and uh, the nx01 stuff that you see here as far as uh, invitations and plating goes one thing that immediately jumps out to me is the front of the of the saucer that looks like there's two photon torpedo tubes perhaps mm. But hmm. I also see the the detailing on the neck on the over on the mm -hmm. right there that shows the same kind of thing. So, what's on the front of the saucer? Is it photons? Oh, you know, we were messing with ideas at that time, and uh, like I was saying, um, t going with the uh, the uh, kind of the refit was not kind of the right thought pattern. But we kind of had to experiment with it because that's kind of what we were supposed to do. And I, I thought, well, I I can't take the nacelle struts back like Andy did, but I could probably segment the, the hull a little bit, but make it really 3D as opposed to a paint pattern. And uh, so that's where that came from. So we experimented with like the torpedo launcher on the bottom and then on the top of the saucer. And so it was just an iteration of trying things in different places. And uh, it went that way on, on pretty much all the sketches. So everything will like have a variety of things. And usually the way the process would go, Kermit would go, I like this, let's leave this. Let's mm -hmm. lose that, and that's kind of how that, that process works. So you'd always give him more things to pick and choose from than, than mm -hmm. less. That's kind of how that whole style and process works. 
so I'm, I'm looking at all these these shapes and obviously you said the brief was to make it more refit but but to take these shapes and go into the TOS Connie what was the sort of thought process behind you they're quite interesting I mean that, that secondary hull is a, is a wonderful varied spectrum of you know smooth and then and then right angles and then you know graceful and then pointing I mean did you in did in your mind were you thinking this would evolve into the Connie or were you very much thinking we have to m meld these two shapes and then see what happens because it's so e interesting yeah I'm not sure if it fits that pre exactly I don't know what's your thought on that because it's so interesting the yeah. angles we well, you know at that time that's when that that morphing stuff was always big on the on the music videos and stuff you'd see one thing morph into another. And uh, I was trying to think that same way with this, like what would morph into the original series and where we were going with a lot of the direction, it, did, it wasn't working because we had to go, we couldn't do the 60s style. No one wants to take that 60s style and go back like to a 50s style looking thing. And as much as you'd want to do that, it, it just was never allowed because with the, they go, well, we want to appeal to a different audience and everyone likes this Star Wars looking stuff and the gritty <laughs> realistic things. So no, aesthetically, no one, would allow you to take that original ship and duplicate it in in terms of the smooth surfacing and the very few windows and stuff. And at that time, uh, the CG world was very, very new to Star Trek. And uh, the way they'd scale things, you know, of course, was windows. And so uh, we would have to have a lot of windows as opposed to the original series, which has very few when you when you look at it compared to any other ship. Mm. I don't think there's there uh, there's maybe maybe twenty windows across the saucer all the way around. If if that many, there's not a lot. Mm. And there's nothing on the top or the bottom window-wise on the saucer either. So that's all you get. But they wanted to see more of that stuff. You know, we want to see living quarters and all that. And um, so as far as trying to make this particular design morph into the original series, it would have been a stretch because it would almost be like this was futuristic going back yeah. in, in time. And it was the same with uh, the other things. Um, but um, just, just a challenge all the time. And, you know, you would – love to take the TOS ship and go back and do a whole 60 style show just based on the Jeffries architecture and the Watch Hang stuff. But yeah. mm, I don't know. I don't think that that world will ever happen, but that's where you'd kind of like it to go as a, as a fan and, and all that kind of stuff. But, but uh, well, you kind of well, got to go with what's thrown in your lap and, and try and make it work. Yeah. Well, it's kind of tying in with the whole windows thing. What size was mm. this thing set at? Like, did you have an established size that you needed to kind of keep it at or was that kind of not decided? The TOS, which is 900, 900 and something feet. I don't have the it's 239 meters. Yeah. And I, well, we'll make this one, uh, maybe two thirds. And so I want to pull back. So, uh, like that futuristic progression of, of, mm -hmm. Where things went with TNG, that things progressively got larger. I thought, well, this definitely needs to go the reverse of the, the uh, original series. Hmm. One thing I, I like about this is that you've you've sort of crunched a few shapes. You know, you've lost that neck, which is which you know is an iterative progression then to a bigger neck. You can see that step, and if you look at the top view, which I think is really interesting, it it sort of bends the eye a little bit how big that saucer is, and then how small everything else is. That's a really mm -hmm. interesting view, but it, it kind of speaks to me that they're using kind of like the, the Zephyr and Cochrane warp engines, as is almost, but then building a ship around that without being able to like improve that technology drastically and then really get to the Constitution class of proportions change because suddenly got this new technology leap, which I kind of right. like. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know if obviously you, you could link in ex I don't know, in your brain if you were doing the exact length of these nacelles to every other view, so I can't say because every other view looks so, looks so ideal, but... It's an interesting detail. Um, and speaking again about the sort of the evolution, one right. thing that, that we always say about, and we always say this about the, the TOS era, is that the simplicity is the advancement. You know, the lack of hull plating, the lack of all this stuff, you know, the smoothness. It's a, it, it, you know, it, it's it's the smartphone. It's, there's nothing to it. You know, as Doug always says, and in fact pulls up his smartphone every mm -hmm. single time we talk to him. This design has a lot of very harsh shapes. A lot of very out there shapes. So what I'm sort of visualizing is almost like a steampunk. When you put this in color, you just have these very like you can see the welds, just sort of like the Anxa one, but less refined almost. You know, you've got the the, the different colors like rust because the way it welds, welds it is wrong, and you've got you know it's it's a it's a, it's a uh, darker gray component in the bottom because it's a different metal. You know, much more constructed as opposed to flowing ship, and that's why it's so 
<coughs> dimensional because pieces are so different and it goes into the corny, it's just one full hull. You know, it has a universal feel. What do you think about that, John? Yeah, and um, uh, I always use kind of old 60s X-Planes as like a reference to a lot of the, the Star Trek stuff mm-hmm. as, as like, a, like a historical type of arc of mm. architecture and it, it just it lends itself so well to the star trek world especially when you look at 60s aviation compared to 60s star trek it all had a very similar feel to mm. it and um you look at modern jets with the the next generation stuff still has a very universal trying to tie in between the two and so going back with the 60s and the 50s and the 40s aircraft for the inspiration for the NX-01 stuff, that's kind of where that, that started from. And you look at some of these these planes um, when they were explain, uh, kind of exploring ideas with the big SAC bombers. They had this one that um, – XB-50, I think it is. But they had the uh, the engines. They weren't on the wings. They were just below the, the cockpit, on either side of the cockpit. They were attached. And I thought, wow, well, I'll just do some of these – these these big bold breakups of the of the body lines and uh, see where we go. At one point we had why don't you mix the Enterprise E with the original series ship and that's why you got the shorter the, the shorter thing. And so you know it's still that was still in everybody's mind in the production office because we just come off Nemesis or uh, Insurrection at that time. And so that that whole TNG world was still really heavy in everyone's mind. Well, it's kind of crazy to be able to go from the future, the furthest future. And then push it all the way back. I mean, you can't help but be influenced, even though it's the so other end of the spectrum. You know, it's, it's kind of strange. Right. Real life, you know, with it, It's very hard to, to, when you wrap your head around it, you're drawing a, a future show, but you're doing yeah. a cast in a future show when neither exists. And then you're trying to tie in real world, since Star Trek is supposed to be like an expansion of our future. Where does this big tie in take place? What, and you always think, what's in the middle? What's in the middle that's going to inspire this mm-hmm. and leave off from where we are in present day? And uh, having a bunch of friends at Edwards Air Force Base, my friend Tony Moore over there, I met him actually during Enterprise. I went to NASA. We have a branch out there, NASA Dryden, and he was the re- one of the research guys. And I went out there, I need to talk to anybody who could maybe answer some Star Trek, future spacecraft. And he came out told me about blending bodies and all of this stuff showed me all these pictures of things that Edwards was working on at the time, the Venture Star, all this stuff that's long gone now. It never made it, but that was where architecture for Space Future was going at the time. And so a lot of that stuff he gave me ties into the NX-01 days and and just about all the drawings, especially the opening credits. All of those ships were basically Mm -hmm. based on the stuff that he showed me out at Edwards. So, yeah. Uh, One question that comes to my mind when I look at this is those two large things on either side of the main impulse engine on the back of the saucer. What exactly are those? Yeah. That was actually more shielding for that uh, the nacelle thing I was telling oh, you about. I uh, did some, some bracing right around there. You'd never have windows mm-hmm. at that point. That was all going to be kind of like a safety. That's cool. So, I like that. That was, that was actually saucer plating for nacelle protection. So that's what that was. That is absolutely awesome. And my final question is, what's with the holes in the pylons? The slits. You know what? That has been my own little goofiness through the, the entire time I've worked on Star Trek. I've always wanted to do a strat that had a negative space. And uh, I just, I, I like, I don't know why. I've always thought that was kind of cool. I saw that somewhere on something. I go, that's pretty cool. So I put it on strats and just about every every Star Trek thing I ever did at that time. And it never made it. So <laughs> there you go. It is, it is cool looking. I, I do like the negative space aspect of that. So. And uh, nice. the reason it's such a difficult thing, especially then, was uh, motion control. Any of that stuff, that just gives you another opportunity to have a mat line issue and that kind of stuff. And, and but so CG, that's kind of, though, John, CG. Well, this was only, they had only talked about doing all this stuff with that at that time. So uh, mm-hmm. all those old, those old rules that stood so heavy, no negative space, no little thin wiry antennas, none of this, none of that. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Okay, so guys, let's look at closing thoughts then, as we do on this show. We'll go Stuart, then me, then closing thoughts on John himself. Stuart. This is very cool. Uh, it's, it's an interesting design, but like I said, it does spark some, you know, JJ reminiscences in my head. Just 
but anyway, um, I, I think it might be too advanced for what they wanted for the NX01, and I'm kind of glad they went the route they did. This is neat, and I would like, like Samuel has said, it's more like a steampunk version of the TOS Enterprise. So I would love to see this thing like brought to life in some fashion. I think that'd be very neat. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure if it really fit the time period they were going for. So I'm kind of glad they went with the uh, NX01 design that they finally did. But I really love the engine detailing and the fact that they're... I love the shielding ideas that you put in there because it's kind of a dangerous new technology. And also the fact that they're kind of sideways. The end caps are sideways compared to what they are in TOS is interesting as well. So, But anyway, that's my take on it. Very cool design, and I would love to see it realized in some... F I don't know if this has been 3D modeled by anybody, but I would love to see it if, if it has been. So so Samuel, what is your take on this uh, design? Would you I'd like to see it realized? I, I liked it, but now I adore it. Having talked to John and, and hearing... Cause that's why this show exists. I mean, to, to anyone who just looked at this design, those plates are just like... It's it's bulk, but there was thought. You know, maybe it wasn't fully developed, but there was thought. I don't honestly see the JJ aspect. I I think that's odd. But you do, you're you're more, you're more passionate against the JJ prize than I am. So I really don't see that so much. I I see this as you got to think of it as this would probably still work as a pre TOS design, but because we know the NX design exists, we can't see that. But if this was that, you could still make that leap because it. Just the bulk would, would you know, the, the the rough shapes would would do that. The only problem with having it be so close is that it would show that the shape doesn't almost evolve at all in you know the the eighty nine years or whatever. That's the only problem with having it be that close. This is why the NX refit works so well because it is that that progressive step. But I I love it. I think this would be a wonderful you know, JJ prize. This has been the new enterprise. In parallel universe, this would be absolutely you know perfect. Honestly, this I have nothing wrong with this ship. Yeah, apart from the top profile is a little bit odd, a little bit, but that's so small. But the I engines are too close together, much like JJ's. <laughs> John, closing thoughts from the genius behind it. Ah, uh, there you go. Well, um, from a artistic point of view, it's always exciting when an enterprise job comes across your desk. And as this went on, I wasn't happy with anything I was doing. And uh, I wasn't liking it. It was just I couldn't kind of grasp what I was trying to do. Hmm. And I was actually, in a way, very glad that Doug got the project of doing it because he was the right guy for this project. He was the one that, that was meant to be to do that, that ship. And what he did was just brilliant. It was perfect. It was absolutely gorgeous. I remember when we saw the first test of it cutting through space like a knife like oh my gosh it was so beautiful and so uh it was it was fun to start on but i wasn't sad to see it go and uh like i was saying i i wasn't i wasn't maybe it was some more time but i wasn't happy with the way i it was progressing i, I knew where i kind of wanted to go but i didn't have time to realize that especially we had with all the other stuff going on so uh, i was glad glad to let it go and let doug take over so it was perfect but but looking back, sort of without that bias, do you think this is a cool design? You know, this was the last one I did, and it was um, it was like you said, it's very much too reminiscent of the original series. I mean, all the elements are there, and that's what was on the the chart at the time to work with the original elements and reconfigure them. And it was it was very challenging to do, and like I said, not a lot of time to do it in. And uh, and um, it'd be okay, not for an NX one ship. And not a TOS ship, maybe somewhere after that, perhaps. Maybe an Enterprise-E era sort of callback. Like they want to make a Connie style in the Enterprise-E era. I could see this sort of working. If you, if you I could see a few this being like, like, like a test model and a stage between something, but not an actual ship. Hmm. I could see like an experimental bed for trying new things, but not a, a, an official ship. With, for uh, new warp like, engine like, sort of thing. Oh, we're going to try this, we're going to try that. And That's yeah. interesting. If it works, works and what doesn't, oh. we'll, we'll move on. That's a good idea. It's the, it's the test bed ship. There you go. That's why there's the extra shielding because the new engines are experimental and dangerous. So. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Cannon. But... Uh, well, that's it, guys. Uh, great to hear from John, as always. It's kind of interesting to get in the heads of the designers and look at their concept sketches and why they did certain things to ask these questions. It's been a really fun ride. So thank you again, John, for joining us. Always love having you here. Thanks. It's always a great treat to talk to you guys, too. And uh, it's it's fun to, to, to put these things into words that you just kept trapped in your head forever. So uh, very fun. Glad you guys do this. Thank you. 
If you guys enjoyed the video, please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe and that little bell notification there. Just click that because then you get notified every time a new video comes out and we don't have to go hunting you down on social media to share with you guys. Also, speaking of sharing, share with all your friends. Share the video wherever you can and let's get the Trek Yards name out there. And if you want to support the show and keep these great ideas coming back to you from 1999 when, when John said, then please support this show. Either go to trekyards.com Click that donate button or over, over our Patreon page, which keeps the lights on as it were. So donate what you can for a monthly show. But again, thank you, John. And uh, I guess we'll see you next week. Very good. And I have to say, two of my favorites are the Andy Probert and the Rick Sternbach series you guys just did. Just brilliant on both of those counts. Enjoyed them very much. Thank you. Nice plug. Thank you, John. <laughs> anyway, guys, check those out. John, John Hughes likes them, so they must be good. Until next time. Until next time, I'm Captain Foley. I'm Colonel Cookings. And John, saying see you later. Bye, everybody.